So very sorry for the delay to keep you waiting. And I'll talk about the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, as I mentioned 31 to 53. So I will take three main points from one one each of the sections and we want to I think you already recited the verses. I'll just mention some of the verses and I'll explain. So I'll talk about three points is the first point I'll talk about is the importance of a sense of honor. The second point I'll talk about is the power of detachment and the power of detachment in daily life. And the third point I'll talk about the art of inner mastery, of self mastery. So the Bhagavad Gita is spoken by Krishna to Arjun when he is disheartened thinking that I cannot fight this war and Krishna is guiding him not so much to fight the war but to learn how to decide what is the right course of action. If, suppose you join a class and say the class is over and a question answer session has started and you come after the question has been asked. Now you may start hearing and okay, this point makes sense, this point also makes sense, but what is going on? What is the topic going on? So if you know the question, then the answer makes more coherent sense. So the Bhagavad Gita is an answer to a question. And that question is, in 2.7 he says, Pruchami Tvam Dharma Sammur Chetaha Pruchami, I ask you, what is Dharma? Now, dharma means, natural action, action that is in harmony with the nature of who we are. That is the essence of dharma. So the question is not just should I fight or should I not fight. It is what is dharma and that universalizes the Gita. The Gita we are discussing about it 5000 years after it was spoken because the question, question driving it is universal. So all of us have to decide at every moment what is the right course of action. To be alive means to face ethical dilemmas. Even if we even if we have a high sense of morality or low sense of morality, everybody has that. Should I do this? Should I do that? So the Gita guides us towards a, a framework within which you can make those decisions. So the previous section till 2.31 talked about one's spiritual identity. So we all have different identities in life in the sense that say you might say that I am a father, I am a mother, I am a software engineer, I am an artist, I am, I am an American. So all these are identities. What the Bhagavad Gita says is all these are functional identities. Below that is a fundamental identity. Our fundamental identity is that we are spiritual, that we are souls. Now after establishing this fundamental identity, in the second section, that is, of, in the third, you could say the second section that Krishna is speaking, that is from 2.31 to 38. There, Krishna is reasoning with Arjun, how should he decide how to act? And he says in 2.34, Sambhavitasya cha kirtir maranadatirichyate that akirtim cha pibhutani kathaishyantite avyayam that Arjun if at this war battlefield you do not fight then you will be dishonored people for time immemorial will speak about your dishonor bhayarana duparatam mamsyante tvam maharathah yesham chitam bahumato bhutvaya sasilagavam People will say you are a coward and you ran away out of fear from a war and that will be worse than death for you. So here Krishna is telling fear that dishonor and therefore do the right course of action. There are different levels of motivation by which we can do the, do the right thing. I saw uh, holding or a cartoon you could say that as a person was caught speeding and the cop asked him didn't you see the speed limit I saw the speed limit I just didn't see you 
<laughs> so, <laughs> what that means is that they don't think speeding is wrong, They're getting caught while speeding is wrong. So, it's <laughs> so sometimes we may do the right thing because we know it is the right thing to do and we feel inspired to do the right thing. But sometimes we may do the right thing because we are afraid of the consequences. Now that is not the best motivation, but that is also a good motivation. Say if a student is studying, it would be great if they study out of love for their subject. But if they study at least because I don't want to fail. I don't want to have that feeling of shame at having failed. That is also a good level of motivation. See, our mind is very tricky. And it's like fighting an elusive enemy. One of my friends is in, uh, is in HIV research. So HIV is a very mutant virus. And whatever we find to deal with it, it, it mutates and comes up with something else. And that's why it has a lot of resilience. So we could say our mind is like the ultimate HIV virus. So we come up with, this is, this is what I am going to do and this is why I am going to do it. We make a resolution. And then after two days, we are caught doing the opposite. And then somebody asks, hey, you are planning to do that? He said, I changed my mind. <laughs> well, whether you change your mind or your mind changed you, is <laughs> difficult to say. So what happens is, the point I am making is our mind is very tricky, very elusive. And so therefore, whatever motivation works, it's best if we have the highest, the best motivation. But even if not, even a lower level motivation, if it makes us do the right thing, that is good. So Krishna is going to give Arjun various levels of motivation. So one level of motivation he gave in the first section, 2.11 to 30 is, you are afraid they will all die, but everybody is eternal, nobody is going to die. So what are, what are you afraid of? It is all based on ignorance, thinking that they are going to die or that you are going to kill them. Then he is giving another level of motivation. That is, if you don't fight, you will be dishonored and that dishonor will be worse than death for you. So now, one principle that we talk about in spiritual life is humility. We all should learn to be humble. Then why is Krishna talking in terms of honor over here? Oh, consider your honor. Don't do something which will dishonor you. So there is a difference between humility and humiliation. Humility is false ego rejected. Humiliation is false ego frustrated. I want to feel great. But somehow, everybody is greater than me. Some people say, I have many hidden talents. The problem is, they are hidden even from me. <laughs> so, everybody has a feeling, I want to prove to the world how great I am. But, they are not able to do that. So, when there is the false ego, we want to prove our greatness to the world, but we are not able to do that. In fact, we are, we are, it turns out that we, we turn out to be very small and insignificant and unproductive and useless and incompetent. Then that is humiliation. And humiliation is extremely painful. So humility and humiliation, the difference is, what is it that we want? Humility means false ego rejected. I don't want to prove to the world that I am great. I may do something great, may, I may do some great contribution. But I am not interested in proving my greatness to the world. So it's a different ball game. And we can't presume that we are at the level of humility. So quite often in life, it is a sense of honor that makes people do the right thing. Or rather, to put it another way, the fear of dishonor keeps people on the right track. And for all of us, if right now I am speaking something, and all of you start frowning at me. If everybody starts frowning, what will happen? Am I doing something wrong? 
is it say if i make a joke and instead of laughing everybody starts glaring at me then i was thinking did i make a politically incorrect joke what happened is it so actually our our actions are constantly monitored through the social feedback that we get otherwise at every moment we can have hundred options see right now all of you are sitting here every one of you is reasonably confident that the person next to you is not going to turn to you and punch you in the face <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Now, why is that? You come to a particular place, and you have a certain set of expectations. Everybody has come in a particular way. So now, if you consider the domain of possibility, you could say it's possible. Isn't it? It's possible, but you could say there is possibility and there is probability. So it's possible. Anything is possible, but it's quite improbable. So. now what is it that keeps us behaving in a way we are expected to behave broadly we all are we all have the non conformist within us and we may be not conform but to a large extent we conform and that's how we can have reasonable social interactions so it is the feedback from others that helps us to monitor our actions and expanding it to a broader level it is a sense of honor that i don't want to be dishonored by others at at the very least i want to be accepted by others it's even better if i'm respected by others again this is not in the sense of ego although it can be it's just in the sense of human connection belonging we need that so a society that has a sense of honor and dishonor that is a mechanism by which people are encouraged or you could say impelled to do the right thing and where there is no sense of honor then what happens people can do anything and society collapses so to some extent this uh, shaming of people who do wrong that is not bad now of course this can go to an extreme and even when somebody is doing a right thing the social environment may become such that they become shamed for that so that's always possible any kind of hierarchy any kind of structure that is made in society that structure can go towards becoming tyrannical that's always a possibility but in general the sense of honor impels people to act honorably and for a warrior for a hero to return away from the war field and not fight to run away that's a great disgrace and that fear of disgrace enables the warriors to fight heroically that's not the highest motivation but as i said we are dealing with a tricky mind so whatever motivation works so it is not that those who are those who are warrior those who are say in the army or the navy they are af- they are not they, it's not that they are not afraid of death or injury everybody has that fear but if the culture is such that they fear dishonor more than death then it is not that they have no fear of death rather they have a greater fear of dishonor and that makes them courageous in the face of death so krishna is telling arjuna over here if you don't fight the world will not think that you are not fighting because of compassion they will think you are not fighting because of cowardice and your you have been reputed as a great hero as a foremost of archers and if you succumb or if you act wrongly you are act you act in a way that is seen as cowardly by others that will be a great disgrace for you see the in the in the material world the more we get a good thing the more the loss of that good thing becomes painful for us 
if somebody has been wealthy and then they become poor poverty becomes unbearable if they always been poor okay this is the way i have lived i got used to it it's not comfortable it's not joyful obviously but if we have got something and then we lose it it's very painful so krishna does that you know you have already been honored now act on that plane if after being honored you are dishonored it will be unbearable for you so this is one level of motivation that we can have for doing the right thing that is the fear of dishonor any questions or comments about this I said I'll take speak three points. So after each point I speak, we'll have some pause and we'll have some discussion. Yeah. I'm just kind of struggling with the text. I mean, Arjuna could say, "Well, if I'm killing respectable people, that is also dishonorable. How is there honor in me behaving violently uh, against people that are respectable who?" I have given many things to me that I value and whom I have some sentiments for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Arjun could argue that those respectable people who have given me so much isn't fighting against them and killing them dishonorable. Yes, definitely. That is one of the arguments and Krishna will address it later. Morality there are two broad conceptions about ethics there is categorical ethics and there is contextual ethics categorical ethics means that right and wrong are two discrete categories everything that falls in this category is right everything that falls in this category is bad so speaking truth is right speaking for lies is bad that is one idea of ethics categorical ethics but contextual ethics says that yes there is categorical but it's not only there are categories but the categories are not absolute so that means say if there is a say a racial or religious riot breaking breaking out and one of our friends is being persecuted or being threatened the friend comes to our house and oh, please save me and we hide them in our basement or somewhere and then those rioters come and knock on the door is this person here Now what should we do at that time? What should we do? Lie. Yeah, isn't it? We should lie. Why? Because lying is bad. But here, not lying will have a far greater bad result. So this is the understanding of contextual ethics. So in contextual ethics, we have to understand. It's like which is a greater evil. speaking lies are evil but being the cause of the death of someone is a far greater evil and that requires a sense of perspective prabhupada explains later in the 10th chapter of the bhagavad gita that intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective so now in this context certainly mm, Bhishma and Drona were his elders, and fighting against them was inappropriate. But they had done the greater inappropriate thing of choosing to fight on the side of Duryodhan, who was evil. They had that was one evil that they had done. Along with that, earlier when Draupadi had been dishonored, they had remained silent. That was also a grievous mistake. it like you can understand the depravity of uh, duryodhan sometimes say there are some thugs or some abusive violent uh, some men say some they might sexually abuse a woman sexually violate a woman normally they will somebody somebody does like that they will drag such a woman catch a woman in private and then try to dishonor her now if somebody does it in public means how brazen a person is now imagine if somebody comes to a police station and there they violate a woman like that that means they have absolutely no fear of law and if the police stay silent at that time then the police are also culpable 
So Duryodhans trying to dishonor Draupadi, he had tried to disrobe Draupadi in public, in the royal assembly. The royal assembly was, that was the time when there was this. Uh, <clears throat> the court was where justice was given. That is the place where law is to be enforced. And there when law is violated, that's a deadly thing. So they had both passively consented to and actively, uh, act now they were actively supporting a person who was an outrageous offender. And thus, uh, in that context, fighting against them was not dishonorable. Because they were supporting a dishonorable cause, although they were honorable men, so fighting against them was the honorable course of action. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. In, it seems like it's, it, it would be good to have, you know, to act according to his honor, at least, as you said, for, uh, at, at least out of fear of consequences. But in today's society, we see that more and more, you know, this, this, this whole system of honor has been, you know, put aside, you know, like the, the shame of doing something or something else has been like, like weakening, weakening more and more for a lot of the things that, that you know, probably in the 50s were unheard of. Yeah. You know, now, now, now it's like, like a commonplace. So how do we act, you know, in a, in a society? How do we act honorably? In society that uh, has less merit over honor? Yes, that's a very good question. How do we act honorably in a society which does not really value honor or there is no sense of shame? I wouldn't say that there is no sense of shame. There is definitely, but the form has changed. Like I said there is a lot of political correctness today. When somebody speaks one statement politically incorrect, they can get so much shame then. In society. Every society has certain actions which are considered taboo and if they do them, say in today's world, now I'm not saying that we should do this, but there are certain minorities, as soon as you criticize them, you are labeled as a, as anti, anti-women, anti-religion, anti-Islam or something like that. I'm not saying that we should do this, but if somebody does that, there is a certain amount of shaming that happens. So there is still shaming, the form has changed. Uh, so, oh, now in some ways this may also be good because we don't want uh, uh, people to carry stereotypes around them and label people and condemn people. So definitely the shaming, uh, as the principle of shaming has not gone away. The context in which it is done has changed. So. But the major actions in society, for example, say uh, the the nuclear family is the is the is probably one of the most time tested sustainable units for the continuation of humanity. And in the past, people if they formed a relationship, they had a sense of responsibility by which they continued. They took care of their children and they did it. Now, it has become commonplace. Again, this is a complex issue. And I'm not making any categorical statements about what is right or what is wrong. But the point is that where uh, commitments are just uh, no, are taken very casually, there is no sense of uh, disapproval of society. Doing the wrong thing becomes relatively easier. So what can we do? I would say two main things. First is that we have to strengthen our own conscience. So we study scripture, we try to purify ourselves by practicing bhakti and our conscience is like our inner own, our own inner guide of what is right and what is wrong. So to the extent the conscience is stronger, it is not because of the social disapproval that we don't do the wrong thing, it's because we ourselves feel strongly that this is, I should not be doing this. So by, by studying scripture and by purifying ourselves through bhakti practices, we can strengthen our conscience. Second is that we can try to ourselves have some relationships that hold us accountable. 
That means even if the broader circle may not have a sense of broader society may not have a sense of shame and disapproval, but we have some friends to whom we are accountable, and with those friends, we not accountable in a humiliating sense, but just in a sense that uh, that we are close enough to each other that that they can question our actions without risking a permanent break of the relationships, break in the relationship. So, as one friend of mine he said, you know, I have stopped giving feedback. Now I only give feed front. I said, what do you mean by feed front? He said, I just feed people. <laughs> I just give them food and be nice with them. If you give feedback, they get alienated. <laughs> so now, a strong relationship is a relationship where some negative feedback can be given, and that that doesn't wound, that doesn't. Uh, destroy the relationship. So, we can try to create at least some relationships where we are accountable. So, without that it is difficult. Okay. You had a question? Yeah, I'm probably not ever going to absorb this particular metaphysical aspect of Krishna coming on him. He has to fight or he will be dishonored or he will be attached to both life and death. If in that context then it, as far as I can understand, in simple logic and in <clears throat> quote a much more modern context, is then what happens to ethics? If killing is okay, you can be detached. Militaries have propaganda like that goes on ad infinitum throughout the world. So when people say you don't fight against the Vietnamese or you don't fight in Yemen or you don't fight, then you will be shamed. I, I think the word shame also needs to be changed because what okay. is what is shame? I mean. You talked about conscience, I understand, and you know, understanding one's own mind. Mm. But people that do crazy things, it's not so much that they're shameful. Most of them are either disturbed or mentally uh, ill one way or another. So I can never really grapple okay. with this Krishna saying, you either fight or you're going to be dishonored. Because then what happens to ethics? That's true. It's a very valid concern that. Should we be acting ethically and not so much by the point of being dishonored? Okay, there are two, three different points, and as you rightly said, it's a difficult issue to grapple. Mm. See, there is a difference. Okay, I'll, I'll come to that. See, there is a difference between weakness and wickedness. Weakness is where all of us have a lower side within us. We have anger, we have lust, we have greed, and sometimes this overpowers our intelligence, it overpowers our conscience, and we do something wrong. That is, in moments of weakness, we become overcome. That is weakness, where our intelligence and our conscience both are active, but they are temporarily overpowered. But different from weakness, Quite another extreme is wickedness. When somebody is wicked, at that time their conscience is more or less numbed, mute. You could say not dead, but almost there. And their intelligence, instead of resisting their lust or anger or greed, has become an instrument of their lust, anger or greed. That means they use their intelligence to act according to their vices, not to discipline their vices. So, when somebody has weakness, forgiveness is desirable. In fact, forgiveness is essential. But where somebody has weak, wickedness, forgiveness is foolishness. So, like somebody, say, somebody is a somebody is shooting criminals, in disc not shooting ordinary people, say, like a terrorist. You know, the terrorist has a gun and the terrorist is shooting people, in, innocent people in the street and if a police person comes over there, the police person has the opportunity to shoot the, police, the terrorist. But he says, okay, I'll forgive you. That terrorist will shoot the police person. So forgiveness, our society needs it very much. We have become very unforgiving about small, 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 small things. So definitely forgiveness is important. But forgiveness works 
amidst weakness it doesn't work amidst weakness where a person's whole world view has become so controlled by their vice where they think that doing the wrong thing or grievously hurting others killing others is a proof of their heroism and their greatness and their strength so they have no conscience but there is no inner force stopping them from doing wrong at that time forgiveness is foolishness so we have to look at not just the bhagavad gita krishna telling arjuna to fight we have to look at the bigger context you know what all did the pandavas do to try to avoid the war say for for year after year after year when they were just teenagers duryodhan tried to poison one of them they remained silent then they just a little older they they were tried to be burnt alive with their mother you know these are warriors it's the natural instinct to retaliate when somebody attacks they control themselves then eventually they uh, they married draupadi and they then they because draupadi was a very powerful king so reluctantly they were given half the kingdom but even what kind of half kingdom it's like completely barren half they accepted that by their own merits they developed that into flourishing kingdom and what happened in a rigged gambling match everything was taken away from them then after that their wife was publicly dishonored and they were exiled for 13 years they honorably fulfilled that sentence and after that as per the terms of the gambling they were supposed to be given back the the kingdom half the kingdom but what did what did duryodhan say he said i will not give you enough land even to put the tip of a needle through so there are different ways of saying no i say if we invite somebody for a program say for a spiritual program we like to go and invite them and they say actually i have to go here i have this engagement i can't come that's a no to the request but if they say even if i die my corpse will not come to your program <laughs> <laughs> see that is not just a no to the request that is like a no banging in the face of the person it's a no to the person so the pandavas were not beggars they had a right to their kingdom and they had they had ready to come down to such a level it's like five villages they are they were the rulers of a prosperous kingdom five villages and that to who went krishna himself went now imagine say there was some volatility between uh, north korea and america over the nuclear weapons say the american president himself goes on a peace mission it's difficult to imagine the current president going on a peace mission <laughs> but suppose he goes and what does north korea do is gone there on a peace mission and they try to arrest him over there it would be like a insult to the whole country immediate outbreak of war would be there how dare so through all these wrongs the pandavas tolerated it and through all these wrongs there was not even a single apology not even a sense of remorse there is only more and more deviousness so when we see this whole history then this was clear wickedness and non violence with the wicked is violence to the victims of the wicked so certainly forgiveness is needed and we all need to cultivate forgiveness but there are times when forgiveness can be foolishness so so all this moral reasoning has already been done and as i said krishna is giving multiple levels of reasoning 
and you see krishna's main reasoning is not that you will be dishonored so don't fight uh, so so therefore fight if that had been the if that had been if dishonor or honor by the sole basis of making decisions then the pandavas when they had to go to the forest they had to live like mendicants in the forest that was so dishonorable for them for one year arjun had to live like a eunuch that was so dishonorable for a man who was so such a warrior an embodiment of virility so they they had accepted dishonor also so here krishna in this context is just telling that various levels at which you can do the right thing so this is one motivation yes the sense of honor and dishonor can be definitely uh, misused to make people do terrible things and we have to guard against that okay how do we define honor yeah it just means that uh, actually there are two there is a sense of honor which is inside and there is a honor which comes from outside there is honor is very different from pride or arrogance see uh, honor many times say people say give me your word of honor that you will do it when you say the word of honor what does it mean promise promise now why would somebody keep a word of honor unless they they take their word seriously they consider that i am a honorable person that's why i have to keep my word of honor otherwise you know it said that in the elections before the before the elections the politicians shake your hands after the election they shake your faith <laughs> so you know when people don't have a sense of honor nothing can function you know now we have so much internet commerce going on so when ebay and stuff like that started initially if there had been no basic trust so people could have sent bounce checks checks that don't work and the seller the buyers could have sent checks didn't work and the sellers could have given faulty products and this whole e-commerce would have collapsed but because of basic trust so a whole new economy was generated so i would say that if we if we find the on word honor a little it has negative connotations because there are honor killings and things like that so but if uh, more uh, the sense in which i am using the word honor is trust that it is a sense of honor that makes us trustworthy and when we are talking about somebody being honored in society that is not simply that they are giving bouquets and garlands and they are praised that honor means that they are considered trustworthy so in the world's eyes arjun you are considered a martial protector of society see if some people are rioting and the police go there to to defend the citizens who are being targeted by the rioters and if the police run away from there because of fear then what will happen then the citizens will lose all their trust in the police for the citizens to trust the police the police have to the function in a trustworthy way and that means the like when the twin towers fell over here it was so horrendous but there are firefighters who risk their lives they knew that the towers might collapse any time still they went inside now what made them do that they risk their life their sense of honor this is my duty and i will do it and they were honored for that they were respected for that so it is when we have a sense of honor then we can be trusted and that's why those who are in a position where they have power and they are meant to give protection they need to have that sense they need to be trustworthy and that's so you can use the i am using the word honor in the sense of trust that it is a sense of honor that makes us trustworthy and when somebody is honored that means they are considered trustworthy 
So if Arjuna is seen to be fighting, running away from a war field because of fear, then who will trust that he can be a worthy protector of society from aggressors? So it is in that sense honor is talked about. Okay? We can talk more about this maybe after that class. So that is the first concept. Uh, the, now I will move on to the second concept. So this is 31 to 38 is talking about this concept of uh, Arjun fight because otherwise you will quote dishonor. It is your duty and not doing your duty will dishonor you. Then from 38 onwards till 53 Krishna moves to another level and he says work with detachment. See earlier just the previous verse he says work with cons okay you do this you will be honored, you do this you will be dishonored, thinking of the fruit but now suddenly he says do not bother about the fruit, he says what is going on. <laughs> so see there are contradictions and there are paradoxes, contradictions means two statements are just opposite to each other but paradoxes are two statements that seem to be opposite but there is some underlying truth to it. So, for example, if you say that in traditional Indian hermeneutics, this example is given. Say somebody, say John. Is anyone by the name John over here? I don't want to offend them. Okay. <laughs> so, John fasts throughout the day, and John's weight is increasing. I say these are two. Con how can they be true? They are contradictory. But they are not contradictory. If both are true, then there's a paradox. Two contradict two statements that seem to be contradictory, but they point to some deeper truth. What is the deeper truth? John eats secretly at night. <laughs> mm. So uh, here Arjun Krishna is poking first fight. Do and actually Krishna is not even telling Arjuna to fight. He's saying do your duty. In this context, your duty is fighting. Krishna stresses not on fighting but on being dutiful. So he says, be dutiful because otherwise you will be dishonored. That's one level of motivation. But then he's given another level of motivation. That is, be dutiful because that will lead to your spiritual growth. So be dutiful while being detached from the fruits of the work. So this concept of detachment is quite difficult to understand in today's world. I was. Uh, last year I was giving a talk in Princeton uh, in university that I was invited over there. So I spoke on this topic with the Bhagavad Gita and then there was a, some uh, Muslim scholar who came and says, I read the Bhagavad Gita and he says, this never makes sense to me. How can you work with detachment? Says, we work, when we work we set goals. It is the goals that help, that inspire us to work. We work so that we can get a salary. How can if you if you are supposed to be detached from from the results of your work, then what will be the motivation to work at all? So here to understand this, uh, there's a first of all terminology has to be very clear. There's a difference between goals and results. The Gita is not telling us don't set goals. In fact, immediately after this Gita happen, Gita is spoken, then the war starts. And every day in the war, they all the warriors set goals. Arjun himself sets goals. So, what is the difference between setting goals and being attached to results? Goals are set before our action, and goals inspire us to act wholeheartedly. Whereas results come after the action and results are not in our hands. I will talk about an equation of four D's. How our actions lead to results? You say this duty plus destiny plus duration leads to desired result. I will repeat this one. Duty plus destiny plus duration leads to desired result. So, if you see examples to illustrate this. Say if somebody is in farm, into farming, then their duty is to plow the land and sow the seeds. 
then now that alone does not guarantee in harvest is duty then the rains have to come the right time the right quantity that is destiny then even if the rains come it's not that the next morning the harvest is going to come duration time has to go duty destiny duration all three together lead to the desired result say if a couple get married they want to have a child the duty is that they unite destiny is you know is a, a union doesn't necessarily always lead to conception sometimes some couples want to have a child but they keep trying trying it doesn't happen so there is something beyond our control that destiny and even if conception happens it's not the next day the child is going to be born there's a period of gestation 9 10 months whatever uh, then that is duration then they will have a child so duty what are the four things duty yes duration duration desire desire yes thank you so now when krishna is saying be detached from the results this is this is 2.47 in the bhagavad gita karmanne vaadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phala hetur bhur ma te sangostva karmani he says that karmanne vaadhikaraste you have a right to do your work ma phaleshu kadachana you do not think that you you are not entitled to the result ma karma phala hetur bhur do not think that you are the cause of the result mate sangostva karmani do not be attached to not doing your duty also so four things krishna is saying over there now let's try to understand these four things in terms of this context so krishna is saying you have a right to do your duty but you don't have a right to the result what that means is don't think that you are the sole cause of the result ma karma phala hetur bhur you are not the sole cause of the result there are factors beyond you that produce the result so actually if you understand this setting goals what will it do settle goals will ensure that we do our duty properly say if i before we are if you are going to study for an exam then i want to get this grade a and if i have to get this uh, this grade a i just i need to study this much i want grade b okay if i study this much also i can do it so once i set a goal that will that will inspire me motivate me to do my duty but after we have done our duty then the result is not in our hands there are factors beyond our control which shape the results so detachment when krishna says be detached from the results he is not saying don't set goals he say you do your work and then let go of the results if the destiny is favorable the results will come the destiny is not favorable the results may not come but you have done your duty that will help you grow so imagine that say a student has to give five exams one after another after another mm-hmm. and say the first exam they don't do very well and then they think oh, how many marks will i get what if i get this much what if it, what, what is this answer i could have written it like this will the examiner be in a good mood when i when this exam answer is assessed if they keep thinking about that exams is already passed what will happen what do you think will happen yeah they want to focus on the next exam or to take even a more graphic example say if there's a cricket match or here in america we have baseball so somebody is playing baseball and the ball is bowled and they could have hit the ball but somehow they missed it now and they have no another chance say they are thinking oh why did i miss that ball why did i miss that ball why did i miss that ball i'll forget it now now the next ball is going to come so detachment means in this context put your work in discrete compartments so detachment is not don't care about the results it means put your work in discrete compartments i've done this work okay this ball i tried to hit i missed it but that's over now let me move the next ball so detachment is actually empowering not demotivating because if we do not have the detachment what will happen is 
sometimes we may have tried our best and still the result may not come how many of you have this experience that you worked very hard at something you did your best but the result didn't come any of you have that experience <laughs> almost everyone is it <laughs> so now of course if we are honest we can also think 